on through because they too can become someone that they never thought they could after having a stroke. And that is why I am so, so very proud to be here with everyone, especially with these folks right here who are going to be entertaining us. I've met a couple of them the, a few days ago, and uh, I was just impressed, very impressed. And I'm just so glad to be able to be here to be a part of this, this affair. The Let's Talk Luncheon. I want to uh, welcome Harks Community Partners, the Reverend Deacon Jack Kahn, who we met just a moment ago. One thing that uh, a lot of people did not know about me is that when I had my stroke, when you do what I do, you have to prove to yourself and you have to prove to others that you still can do. And that's what I think is very important for anyone who has a stroke. You have to try and prove to yourself and to others that you're not just gonna waste away. You can do, and it's up to you and to folks like you, you in the audience who help us to survive, who help us to move forward, who help us to take that next step, because we all need to take that next step. And at times you think that there is no way to do that, but there is with help. And that's why you have Hark in our community. I did not know about Hark a few years ago. I had heard casually about it. But when I got a chance to go visit, to see what Hark does in this community, you have my support for the rest of my life. That's one of those things that, that just happens. You know, I want to, um, right now, call up Emily Connor Hempel, Hark's chair, chairman of the board, or chairwoman of the board, I should say, you know, uh, because she is going to be giving us sort of the greeting for this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Emily Connor Hempel. I'm about to bring it to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, of course. You want me to hold it for no, you? No, I got it. Thank okay, you. all right. I'm just going to, uh, I have the pleasure this morning of introducing the Hark Heralds.
the Hark Heralds. Come on, give them another big round of applause. They deserve it. And initially, I failed to recognize uh, the director, music therapist, Ingrid Moeller. Could you hold your hand up so folks can know exactly who you are? And then there's also Whitney Morelli and the Hark Speech Pathologist team. You know, it's, a, it, it's amazing when you see folks come out and perform, and normally they would not be doing this, but they're doing it just for you. And uh, that is just an amazing expression of their love, and especially the payback, so to speak, from what you have done to help them. Okay, now, Emily, you can take center stage right now. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Emily Connor Hempel. I am the um, chairman of the board here at HARC. Um, what an amazing group of participants. Way to go, HARC Harold. And thank you, Jose. Jose, oh, excuse me. Um, so you know, heart depends on your support to fund our programs and service the people with aphasia. Okay. As you may know, uh, aphasia is a difficulty communicating, speaking, and understanding words um, as a result of a stroke or a brain injury. Um, as Heart celebrates our 11th year, gosh, can you believe it? 11 years. Um, I hope you all will continue to be friends of Heart and help so many here in Houston live happily and sex success successfully, excuse me, with aphasia. I am so proud of this resilient community. Um, and, in, and I'm so incredibly grateful for the fantastic staff at HARC. You guys have no idea what they've done. Not only, you know, in the past few years to conduct all of our programs virtually, but to get back and, um, to HARC itself in person. Um, um, and make sure that our participants are safe and we're keeping distance and we're sanitizing and we're doing all of those things that are necessary in this day and age. Um, but with their hard work, we ensure that the participants, a world where there is no silence. In the past few years, we have, ex we have realized how extremely important these programs are for our participants. With that isolation, lack of ability to get out there and socialize, our programs have been a way for our participants to interact and communicate. HARC has now expanded to serve all of Texas. Um, yes, right? We are able to do that um, through Zoom, home visits, and little touches all over and throughout Texas in our community. Um, it is friends like you all that allow us to continue to open our doors into a world where no one is left silent. Now, it is my great honor to introduce our luncheon chairs, BJ and Delby Willingham. You guys, they have just worked so hard and generously, and we are so, so thankful for you guys.
In the words of uh, a longtime and original participant uh, at heart, Don Eisen, wow. Uh, he would have just been spectacularly pleased at, at this assemblage. It is so fun to see everybody here today. So many friends. It's just a wow moment. Uh, I'm B.J. Willingham, and my wife, Delby, is here. Stand up, Delby. We have had a great time working on this luncheon. Uh, we are honored to have had the opportunity to, to chair it. It's a fabulous event. But we you only did a little of it. There are a lot of other people who really did the bulk of the work, and I, I just want to thank them from the bottom of my heart. The host committee, and you guys know who you are out there, and you have filled many of these tables and chairs, and we really, really appreciate it. The advisory board and the board of directors, very well represented here, uh, and, and have done amazing things for us as well. There's a luncheon committee. They did a lot of the hard work in terms of, you know, wh where and how and what, and I appreciate that. And then, most of all, the staff and the volunteers who have done most of the work. We couldn't have done it without them, and, and I just want to give you them my, my hand. Now I have the pleasure of making what I consider a wonderful announcement. We have an anonymous donor who's stepped up with a challenge. Uh, they will match up to $35,000 anything we raise here today. $35,000 is huge for Hark. It's no accident that there are envelopes on your tables with pens. <laughs> And, and you're you know, allowed to take the pen home with you to remind you of Hark. <laughs> but as my dad always said, if you're going to dig, dig deep. And that's what I would encourage you to do. But now, it's in time, now it's time for you guys to enjoy uh, a look at Hark's good work in action. So. They first told us that the stroke had hit his speech center. And then the next day they told us it was a much bigger stroke than what they thought. Their best case scenario was that he would be in a facility for the rest of his life with no use of his right side, um, no use of his left leg. He would hopefully understand us, maybe. He wouldn't be able to talk and he would have his memories and hopefully recognize us. Miriam. Daughter. Daughter. So, Miriam was the only thing that he said at Methodist for anything until we got in the ambulance to transfer to Tear and he looked at me and he said, I love you. And I said, you've been holding out that whole time, haven't you? And he did that. We got home four days before she was born. And his biggest challenge was... Speaking well? Speaking anything, speaking, Walker, Kane, and now again, <laughs> um, Kurt, <sighs> um, Kurt, Kurt, um, unrestricted, unrestricted. I think the first time I actually heard aphasia was at TIR. Um, I had never heard of it before. Aphasia is the loss of language due to the injury to the language centers of the brain. So in your brain, we all have specific parts that control understanding speech and control producing speech. The first time in Hark. The no speech, no anything, yes, no, I don't know. So Hark's a really special place. Um, it's a community center dedicated to giving people with aphasia a space.
space to not only work on their language skills and to work on rewiring that brain, but a space to work on their confidence and to be amongst people that have aphasia and know aphasia. And it's been shown that having a place like HARC in conjunction with traditional therapy or you know, even after traditional therapy is over can help someone with aphasia continue to make those language gains you know, years after their stroke. A little bit at a time, then, okay. Um, that more comfortable? Comfortable. Um, when I first met Matt, um, I think he was, he was still having quite a bit of trouble getting his ideas out in a complete I know what he would consider a well-formed sentence. I think there's a great community at Hark. And it's a community that can understand what's going on and we can learn from each other and how to be able to communicate better with each other and be able to share awareness of what aphasia is. Yeah. Any communication is communication. Whether I'm speaking, whether I'm writing, whether I'm pointing to something, it should all be valued as you trying to get a message across to your loved one. Um, and empowering them with that communication so that it's not so um, frustrating when the words don't come. Hark. In person. Yeah. Good. Actual people, not screens and stories, but people. Oh my God. Good. Love the joy and love the you and me talking or no talking, Fantasia, good. I see Matt continuing to grow in his service and his leadership to the places that he holds dear. And, you know, starting with his family um, and then expanding to his faith and continuing to expand to in the community. Um, like we have, I've seen him grow here um, from being more early in his recovery journey to now where I see him taking a more active role in the conversation it's at HARC and, and to trying to help others engage the way people helped him engage. He spends a lot of time on HARC, four days a week, two to three hours a day, um, which is awesome. His speech has gotten a lot better from it. Um, he volunteers once a week at the Hope Chest, which is a resale shop. So it feels so inspiring to see his progress, and I just can't wait to see where he goes in the future. For anybody that just found out that their loved one has aphasia, know that it's hard, and it's a lot of work, but it can get better. You just have to be really patient and try and figure out what works. Because there's so many different ways that we can communicate that may not require words. I think the future is bright for HARC. I'd love to see HARC continue to serve people across the Texas area with its virtual services. I'd love to see it continue to bounce back from this pandemic and get more people in the doors and just continue to serve people with aphasia and their caregivers and giving them that hope and that way to communicate at home. And furthermore, that sense of community that being here gives everyone, from the volunteers to the HARC members to the staff, we're really a part of a community. So from being told the horrible option of being in a facility to where he is now, all I can say is God said no. He is a walking, talking, driving miracle.
everyone. My name is Kathleen Swallows, and I'm a speech-language pathologist at HARC, and I have the pleasure of introducing my friend Matt. Howdy. I am Matt Campbell. Welcome to HARC Luncheon. I've, I've been here in HARC, virtual and in person, about a year and a half. TJ and HARC have given me community, fellowship, and hope. Please continue the support with your gifts, time, and service. Thank you, bless you. Matt, I want to say thank you to you. You have an amazing story. And you have accomplished things that no one probably thought you would, except for the people at HARC. So now the plea is for all of you to help HARC continue the services that it is providing to the community, not just our community. But we all know that now HARC has basically extended its arms to other parts of the state. So it's not just the folks here in Houston. It's not just the folks in Katy. It's not just the folks in Galveston. It's folks throughout the state of Texas right now who can benefit from all of the services that HARC provides to folks in our community immediately. You know, there are some volunteers throughout the ballroom, and they're going to be looking at you with some kind eyes, because there are also some envelopes in front of you as well. We already heard that you can keep the ink pens, but now we want to uh, <clears throat> see if you want to get... If you're a Hallmark fan, or you're just a fan of Ashley's, Please help me give Ashley a big, huge welcome to our heart advocate, Ashley Williams. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having me here, and thank you for that intro that makes me sound very fancy. I am an actress. I have been at it for a long time, and although I do begin shooting my next Hallmark movie in about two weeks, I, I, uh, I stand before you here today technically unemployed. At the age of 22, upon receiving my BFA in theater, like many other unemployed actors, I moved back into my parents' house. They lived in Westchester, New York, which is a short 40-minute commute from Manhattan where all the action was. So every morning, I would pack up my enormous camping backpack, the same one that I used to backpack across Europe the year prior, and this pack had water, <clears throat> and it had snacks, and multiple changes of clothing, including a variety of high heels and sneaker options, makeup, the occasional wig, depending on what part I was trying out for that day, and I would arrive in Grand Central Station. And every day, I'd have multiple auditions for commercials, plays, TV shows, the occasional movie. And these were long, hopeful, exhausting, and exhilarating days as I strived to become a real live working actress. <clears throat> so I learned at this time that it was critical to locate certain way stations around the city to reset to take a break, somewhere to change clothes, guzzle some water, and refresh. And I was on a tight budget, but I used it well. So $19 a month got me a 24-hour fitness membership, meaning that I could grab a shower at 14 different convenient sites in the city between castings. I had a friend that worked at the Starbucks on 19th and Broadway, and she would always give me a cup of milk and a banana for free. 
But the best, the most reliable way station for this ambitious, often scared, sometimes bold, unemployed actress was my mother's office in Battery Park. My mother, Linda, was a high-ranking fundraiser at the Michael J. Fox Foundation, but what was most exciting to me was her fancy office. The office people up front knew me, and I'd wave as I'd sneak past them to flop down on my mother's office couch and regale her with the tribulations of the day's adventures. She'd stop her work, and she would listen so patiently. I didn't get a call back for the Broadway play, Mom. Or, my agent is ignoring me. Or, oh my gosh, Mom, I nailed it. I think one day I'll actually be able to get a real job. So sometimes she'd read lines with me, or uh, rehearse for an audition, or give me a pep talk. And sometimes I cried, and she hugged me. She repeated words to me then, as a young adult, that she said to me often as a child. A quote from Julian of Norwich, one of the first known female authors, who, despite the looming Black Plague in 1347, found peace, writing, all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. It was a gift to be just out of college and entering grown-uphood and yet able to walk through those doors and be able to suddenly be parented again. So one day, and this was in the summer, I remember being really hot and sweaty. The pack was feeling particularly heavy that day, and I was so looking forward to the strong air conditioning of my mother's office. And when I walked in, she was sitting on the couch. She was bent over the yellow pages of the phone book. And when she saw me, she looked up, and she said, Oh, Ash, thank goodness you're here. How do you spell the word Chicago? Now, my mother, Linda, had always been so sharp, so quick-witted. She'd worked for Newsday in the 60s as a journalist, and writing had always been a bit of a way station for her, if you will. She was known for her driving questions and her skill with words. After she had us kids, she went back to work full-time for Sarah Lawrence College. She had an uncanny talent for writing pledge letters, describing with passion where principal gift donations would go and how they would change the lives of students for years to come. She was recruited to work at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and she took that skill to the next level, which included training people under her. And when I was 22, by the time she got to the Fox Foundation, she was one of the top fundraisers in the nonprofit sector, due largely to her brilliant expertise as a writer. So to see this powerhouse with words, sitting on that couch, asking me how to spell the word Chicago, was a life-altering moment in our relationship. I remember throwing my pack down on the floor and sitting next to her on the couch. She started crying when I hugged her. I'm having trouble with words, she said. And it was, it was hard for me to bring myself to say, all will be well. So for the first time ever, it didn't feel like that was the case. My mother was diagnosed with primary progressive aphasia shortly after, something that I think this group knows a little bit about. Can I get a quick check-in with you guys? How many of you here have a family member or a close friend who's been affected by some form of aphasia? Can I see your hands? Okay. Hello. I am you. How many of you here are living today with some form of aphasia? Hello. I see you. I see you. Moments ago, and I don't think this is well-known news, Bruce Willis got up on a stage with Demi Moore and announced his diagnosis with aphasia, the end of his career as an actor. Aphasia is an impairment that affects 2.5 million people in the United States today and 160,000 people in Canada. Now, that number is purely based on stroke numbers, so you can imagine that primary progressive aphasia, a common symptom of neurodegenerative disease, makes that number way, way higher today, especially as medicine and human longevity continue to pass new and exciting boundaries, extending the lives of humans. The aphasia numbers in this country and worldwide will grow as they have been. Now, I know each one of our journeys with this disease are unique to each of us. We are all writing our own story 
every day as we twist and shout our way through this. In our family, my mother was embarrassed, and we were instructed to not talk about her aphasia, which was hard. So I've always been kind of an open book. But we did our, our best to respect her wishes. We did, however, begin working with a speech therapist several times a week. Can I get a show of hands? Has anyone here ever worked with a speech therapist? OK, hi. I want to hear your stories. Um, in our case, this woman, well, she was kind of a young woman. She was lovely. She was young. She was wildly optimistic. But oh, man, did my mother not like her. <laughs> I remember one day we were in a speech therapy session together and she, uh, this therapist, she held up a card which was an illustration of a girl playing tennis and she asked my mom, okay, so what is this girl doing? And my mother, a brilliant college educa educated professional woman who spent much of her teen years slaying it in tennis, by the way, looked at the picture and she scoffed, duh. And then there was this pause, and I could see the word tennis on the tip of her tongue. It's, you know, she said, and then she mimed holding a racket and whacking a ball. Yes, I said when I saw her do this. And then I whispered something that we'd learned from the therapist, category. This was a, a tactic that we'd been taught to try to help her out when she struggled to find a word. It was as if I was trying to help her cheat on a test in high school. And again, she whacked the imaginary tennis ball, starting to get frustrated. And I just, I so badly wanted to help her. So imperceptibly, with the awkward air of a horrendous ventriloquist, I s said, tennis. <laughs> what? My mom whispered, and it was just the three of us in this office, which was a tiny office. And uh, I said, tennis, this time even louder. This poor speech therapist said, I can hear you, Ashley. <laughs> So speech therapy was not for us, but it did end up being a gateway for our family. And this speech therapy center was incredible. And they had weekly support meetings for caregivers and people living with aphasia. And that ended up being an absolute lifeline for us. We found comfort and resources in the weekly meeting with a community of people just like us, trying to navigate all the aspects of this new life. For as much as aphasia limited my mother's ability to communicate, we found the most comfort and stability by talking and communicating about the condition with other people who were, were in our similar situation. We discovered that we were not alone in our struggle. There was a universality to what we were going through. Sometimes we laughed together. Sometimes we cried. But there was this sense of togetherness that became a salvation in our journey. And from what I understand, Hark's priority is not dissimilar. This organization prioritizes education and encourages the community out of isolation. I wish I had known about Hark back then. I feel so lucky to be with all of you today. My mother was eventually diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, which presented mostly in the form of aphasia until her final years. A few years before she passed away, she reached a point where she was rarely able to string many words together. And the truth is, though, that due to education and guidance from professionals and others in our situation, we got along just fine. With some sleuthing and the occasional, often hilarious misunderstanding, my dad, my sister, my brother, and I could speak mom. And most importantly, she felt understood. Along with the loss of speech, it had also become no longer safe for her to drive, which was something she always loved. So sometimes, just for fun, I would drive her out to the empty parking lot down the street and we'd switch places so she could drive and I would sit in the passenger seat and these were some of our best times. I would put loud music on and we'd roll down the windows and I always had my hand on the emergency brake just in case and she would drive around in circles whooping and gunning the gas. We screamed with laughter together among all the other things I was doing as her caregiver including making driving possible possible for her in this way, I think I had now become her new way station, her place to let loose. Here comes the sun, we'd sing, or proud Mary, rolling on a river is right. So one day, 
we were driving and she got confused. She felt a little bit out of control behind the wheel. We were totally safe in the big empty parking lot, but she got scared. So we stopped the car and we turned off the music and we were both quiet. And I finally said, do you miss driving, mom? I was prepared for a nonverbal response, as was her norm at the time. But this time, her eyes filled with tears. My authorship, she said. I gasped. Authorship. She said the word authorship. There was no more perfect word for what she'd felt like she'd lost over the course of her journey with aphasia. And yet, in that moment, a writer, through and through, even when the disease had taken so many of her words, she found it, authorship. Her ability to navigate the world through words, her independence as a storyteller, her skill for composing her own personal narrative as a professional, a mother, and a human. That is what aphasia can take from us. And yet, in some brilliant moments of divine clarity, we can close our eyes. We can reach into the aphasia and grasp the most perfect of words. Despite all, we can prevail. My mother died five years ago after living with primary progressive aphasia for 12 years. I do miss her. I miss being parented by her. I miss her advice, her belief in me, her encouragement. I miss her office. I miss the safety that I'd feel when I plopped down on her couch and knowing that I was loved despite all the scary things that being an unemployed actress may entail. But here's what I discovered. Talking about her, convening with people like you who understand this condition, this is my new way station in life. I'm still often an unemployed actress every day now, mourning the death of my mother, but you are where I can rest. Reset, refresh. Together, today, we can put down our heavy packs and plop down on the couch of the Junior League of Houston, thank you for having us, and feel the rhythm and the relief of community. I feel her here right now with all of you. Because of Hark, and as the authors of our journey through aphasia, we are able to gather here today and continue to have authorship in our own unique story. Together we can roll on this river. Today we can know as we look into each other's eyes and share each other's stories that all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. Thank you. Ashley, thank you so, so very much. Wonderful story of love, resilience, and caring for someone who you love. Thank you for the share, sharing that with us. You didn't have to share it the way you did, but you have a very unique way of expressing yourself. You bring humor into a situation that has us giggling and laughing, but then you hit us with that point. Boom. <laughs> But it's not so bad when you do it that way. So thank you so, so very much for sharing something very personal that you really did not have to share. But I think everyone here in the room enjoyed it. So let's give Ashley another big round of applause. OK, now it's time for me to get serious. You see these folks walking around with these red aprons? Guess what they're looking for? those envelopes on the table. So please, please give what you can because Hark is doing an amazing job here in our community uh, as well as in other communities here in the state of Texas and can't do it without your help. That is one of the most important things. And 
you can also tell your friends about HARC if they don't know about it already because many times that is the way an organization is able to survive by word of mouth and the word spreads very very rapidly when it's something that affects so many people on the planet and people just don't realize that there are a lot of folks affected by aphasia but now after today you can tell them that there's a, an organization here in the city of Houston that is the Houston Aphasia Recovery Center. And that center needs your help. So do what you can to try and support it. I've enjoyed my time here with you this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed your time. I know we've all enjoyed Ashley. So let's give her one more time a big round of applause. We want to thank you for being here today. We look forward to seeing you next year. And you can also bring a friend next year so we can add some additional tables and get some more of these envelopes filled from some other folks as well. Please have a safe journey to your destination this afternoon. Thank you. If I try to sum it up, I know I get it wrong Sometimes if it don't sound right I apologize, I just said it cause I'm wrong Four quarters, three minutes, you never fit in it So I just take you line by line I'll be writing about you for the rest of my life